Today's episode of Socially Democratic is presented to you by Dunn Street. Dunn Street is a campaign agency that specialises in community organising. We only work with people that want to build power to make the world a better place, including community-based organisations, trade unions, progressive businesses and social democratic parties across the globe. We develop community engagement strategies to win campaigns both big and small. We train engagement staff and volunteers in the Gantz framework of leadership, organising and action. And we help folks craft their own story through the practice of public narrative that connects people through shared values and moves them to act together. And if you want to act together with your community or folks in your neighbourhood to build power for change, then hit us up at dunstreet.com.au. Today's episode is also brought to you by Morris Blackburn Lawyers. As Australia's number one plaintiff law firm, Morris Blackburn believe the law should serve everyone and not just those who can afford it. Uh, Morris Blackburn have helped influence some of Australia's most important legal decisions, including equal pay for women and Indigenous workers, and helped over 500,000 Australians get the compensation they deserve. Morris Blackburn Lawyers, experience you can count on. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Socially Democratic, your weekly centre-left politics and organising podcast that drops every Friday that dives into the progressive campaigns and issues of the day and the people leading them from home and abroad. And it's the end of the month, and that means that we have got David Feeney on the show this week for our uh, recap of Australian politics for the last uh, last month, for the month of March, uh, known as the Feeney Files or Feeney, Feeney's Hour of Power. Still not sure which we're going to settle on. Maybe you can tell us. Um, so we're going to be talking about um, what's happened in the last month, which is including uh, the Dunkley by-election, uh, the Tasmanian state election, uh, by-elections in, Tas- in South Australia and Queensland, um, some foreign affairs issues as well, uh, and a whole bunch of other things. Plus, um, viewers or listeners' questions. Um, we've got two questions to share today. If you want to give us uh, any questions ahead of the next episode at the end of the month, just uh, drop us a, uh, a note or send us a message on one of our um, social media uh, accounts for Dunn Street. So um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or, or LinkedIn. Just send us a message. Uh, and we'll be sure to include that and put that to David for our uh, end, of, uh, end of the month recap. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like the show, please uh, give us a positive review and give us five stars. And for all the updates, follow Dunn Street on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. All right, let's get to today's episode. Okay, we are taping this one. On a Tuesday, I was about to say a Monday because it feels like a Monday, but it's not because of the public holiday yesterday. We're taping this one on a Tuesday. Uh, lunchtime on the lands of the Wurundjeri people. And it is the end of the month, start of the month kind of thing. And that means it is time for our monthly, I call it the Feeney Files. He calls it the Feeney Hour of Power. Maybe we'll let our listeners decide what is going to be the official name of this segment, this monthly uh, recap of Australian politics. But it's great to have him back on the show, former uh, National Assistant Secretary, former Victorian Campaign Director, Senator and Member for Batman. David Feeney, welcome back to the show. Yeah, nice to be with you. And if we're going to let the listeners decide, I'll ring them both and make sure I can swing the result. Well, maybe I'll just get a couple more listeners to listen and stack out the vote and uh, win myself. How about that one? Yeah, okay. Expand the franchise. Yeah, good, good. Okay, a lot's happened in uh, in uh, March. I'm trying to work out what month has just gone past March. So we're going to recap the month of March. We had uh, a federal by-election. We had a state election. Uh, We had former prime ministers getting back in the news again. Um, and we had a um, treason claim by uh, the chief spook and a lot more as well. So let's try and cover off as much as we possibly can in this hour. And also we'll ask some of our listeners to send in some questions, which we'll do at the end uh, and put them to uh, Mr. Feeney. Let's start with the Dunk- Dunkley by-election was held early in March um, after uh, the sad passing of the uh, Labor MP for Dunkley, uh, Peter Murphy. Uh, so Labor's uh, Jody. I hate. I I knew I shouldn't have done this because I'm not sure how to pronounce her surname. Still, ba- Bellier, Jody Bellier, uh, was running against Liberal Party's Nathan Conroy, um, and in the end, Labor held on to the seat of Dunkley. 
uh, with a 52.7% uh, two-party preferred. Uh, we talked about this on the show last time, David. Um, this was a potential b- banana skin for Labor, I think. Um, and I w- I'm interested to, in the post-by-election analysis, you know, the the Liberals were saying, well, Labor's going to win it anyway. And this is Labor heartland and just trying to, you know, spin it in a, well, this was, if we'd won it, it would have been a miracle anyway. And I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, this isn't traditionally Labor heartland. The Liberals have held it for a long, long, long time. Um I can even recall when I was a party official, we, you know, we ran Peter Murphy and ran a field campaign in the 2016 federal election, and it was a smoky, like it was a long shot. It was a kind of, let's give this a crack because there's, it's an open race, but we know we're not going to win, but we think in the future we might be able to bring Dunkley into our actual proper target seat list. Um, we did win it in 2019, and then we had a, season, had a sophomore swing to us in 2022, which took it to like 6 or 7%, and it's come back to 52. I think this, is a, this was a great result for Labor, uh, and I think this was a potential banana uh, um, slip up for, for, for us. I want to get your th- thoughts on the result itself. What are the key takeaways for Labor in this uh, Dunkley by-election result? Yeah, we did talk about it in our last episode, and I think there we laid out the reasons for why this was such a significant contest. Um, we talked about, in particular, how it was something of a crossroads for the Liberal Party and for Peter Dutton, because Peter Dutton, of course, is telling um, the Liberal Party that their future is in the outer suburbs. Uh, and that rather than spending all of their time and resources trying to recapture their former in a heartland of um, yeah, the eastern suburbs, Melbourne and so forth, and recapturing ground from the teals that they need to go forth and uh, multiply in the outer suburbs. And as you say, Dunkley should have been a perfect target for this because it is a seat that, um, you know, eight times out of ten is a Liberal Party seat. They've got a long history of representing it. Um, they are well known in the local community this is the kind of place where they should have made um, gains, and they didn't. Uh, and that's, the, I think, the principal story. The, 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 the media did sort of make the point that this is a terribly important by-election and if the Prime Minister loses here, that'll be a disaster and this is going to set the scene for months and months and months and then as soon as the result was over, they probably forgot about it. But it it, it is an important contest. It, it does mean that um, Albo in the immediate aftermath of um, uh, re-engineering the Stage 3 tax cuts, uh, came away with an electoral win. If he'd been defeated in Dunkley, then that would have been written up as something of a rejection of uh, those Stage 3 tax cuts and something of a rejection of Labor's current economic strategy. Of course, um, the reverse is the case. So uh, for Albo, it was a terrific result, and for Labor, it was a terrific result, and... Uh, Dunkley is a is is a solid win. Um, for the Liberal Party, it means that those very significant questions remain unanswered. What is their strategy to come back? How do they win the outer suburbs? How do they recapture their former heartland, or are they doomed to fall between two stalls with neither? Um, so yes, I would have thought that um, uh, that was a sort of a, a big national question for the Liberals. And then there's something of a more local question. We saw as soon as the polls had closed and the commentators were roaming amok um, that conservative commentators really don't hesitate to bag the Victorian division of the Liberal Party. Um, They kind of have grown accustomed to describing it as, uh, you know, the idiot in the family. And uh, and we saw a couple of Liberals come out and say, you know, we, we need to reposition Victorian Liberal Party and yada, 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 but... They just have a desperate problem here, don't they, which is a, they're, they're a lack of critical mass in terms of the number of MPs, the number of members that they have um, in order to keep the fight up. So the Victorian division of the Liberal Party, um, you know, the, the idiot in the family needs a lot of help. Um, and part of the problem is that that help has to come from a national organisation and that national organisation is not predisposed to running and understanding campaigns in the state of Victoria. So um, difficult days ahead, I think, for the Victorian Liberals as well as for the Liberals more generally. And for Albo, some some, some manoeuvre room. 
that victory gave him some manoeuvre and some space to keep doing what he's doing and hit in the lead up to the budget. A number of things there to unpack from you there, David. So true about the Liberal Party's conundrum with Victoria. It feels like that the Victorian branch of the Liberal Party is, yeah, you know, like like you say, the idiot cousin, or they're kind of getting bullied by their older cousins who are saying, "Be like us in New South Wales and Queensland. Um, you, you know, use our type of politics that we are so successful." in executing in Queensland, do that in Victoria, and it just doesn't work. And they're in this sort of halfway house because they can see that they're losing all of these votes to their traditional blue blood, um, eastern suburban type voters, whilst they're trying to pretend that they're going to be like Queensland and go after, chase after this outer suburban voter, and they've not executed that well enough. I was talking to some people from the the Labor Party that were on the campaign, and they were saying that a lot of the stuff that the Federal, the national media were running in the lead up to uh, the Dunkley by election that these were the issues that were going to, you know, dictate the election um, outcome, like uh, the voice, uh, refugees, uh, re- releasing the detainees, et cetera. And our field operation was saying that on the doors, none of that was coming up. Like if it was coming up, it was coming up from locked in liberal voters that were just parroting Sky News, you know, slash Liberal Party slash Advance Australia lines. But actual undecided or persuadable voters were just not mentioning any of the stuff that was in the national media. And in one way, it just shows a disconnect between the media and what voters on the ground are experiencing, but also shows a disconnect between the Liberal Party strategy and what voters actually want. Um, And I think that in a campaign where this was a chance, they could win this one back, right? And here's another thing that you and I have talked about in previous podcasts. By-elections are always problematic for Labor because of turnout. And in the end, there's 112,000 electors registered in Dunkley, only 96,000 of them voted. So 84% turnout um, in this by-election. And the majority of those that didn't turn out would have been our people. So this was one where we definitely could have lost um, and their campaign was just completely disconnected from what voters want on the ground, um, and we managed to get a result. And I just it's amazing how they can just walk away, how the Liberal Party and the media can walk away, you know, well, we fucked up that strategy again, and then off we go again and just keep doing our thing, right? Like, we're, someone's going to hold these people to account. You morons, you keep getting this wrong, and no one is calling you out for it apart from piss out podcasts like this. Like, it's, it's just well, keep they, no the same strategy, you know? Go. No matter how bad they go, Simon Benson's going to look after them on the front page of the next day's Australian newspaper. Um, Keith Wollahan, the Liberal Party member for Deakin um, and a a new member um, and someone who I rate, um, he, uh, I think, belled the cat to some extent on the night of the Dunkley result when he made the point um, that while the campaign had made plain what the Liberal Party is opposed to, they had not proposed anything, that there, that when Liberal Party candidates and sitting members, um, you know, go out of a weekend um, and do whatever campaigning they do, they still don't have a positive message of any significance, excepting for a proposition to bring civil nuclear power to Australian suburbs, which is, you know, pretty problematic. Um, so uh, Keith Wollahan made the point, you know, we've really got to start building a positive story about what the Liberal Party is going to offer Australians. Now, it's perfectly understandable that the Liberal Party is not going to, um, you know, launch a a giant policy manifesto ahead of a by-election. I get that. But maybe one policy Mm. that might have captured the imagination and given them something to say. Um, I think part of their problem was just that they're, policy cupboard is empty. Now, we all know the power of negative campaigning. We all know it's a by-election. We all know they're in opposition. I'm not suggesting the pressure is acute, but they do need something. Mm. If their MPs across Australia are armed with a single positive message at this moment, and that's how we're going to bring a nuclear reactor near you, um, then they have got themselves in a bit of a problem and they need to have a story. Why does the Liberal Party exist? What's it for? It can't just be what it's against, powerful as that is. They need a, they need a positive message. And in the by-election, they did no work to produce 
a positive policy of any shape or size. Um, and so I think that that, that was a, a, you know, a fatal mistake. So from the Labor side of things, um, bullet dodged, great result, um, vindication of the, the work they've done since the turning of the new year. Um, what does Labor do to continue to build on, on this? What do you want to see from Labor from the, you know, when the by-election ended all the way through to, I guess, the budget's coming up next and then moving into the second half of the year? What, how does Albo build on this good momentum? Yeah, it, it, I, I have reflected on this a little bit because it, it's just so hard in the contemporary environment. With, with politics umpired in between elections by journalists and journalists just being so insatiable about the amount of stories, that, about the pace that they need things to move at, um, you know, the, the journalists are now writing, even as we speak, um, stories about how you know the government started to run out of momentum and run out of puff. You know, five minutes after it just kicked the crap out of the Liberal Party in the outer suburbs. Um, so, in part, I think uh, what the the government needs to do is kind of ignore the noise and, to some extent, trust what it's been doing. It, I mean, it, it is winning contests. Its economic management pro credentials are in good order and will only strengthen. Um, the, the government's obviously got very significant challenges, you know, NDIS, um, industrial relations reform. You know, the, the, the pace of, uh, of those reforms will keep um, the government busy and, frankly, immigration um, and uh, d detainees is going to continue to be a problem for the government. You know, the, the longer that remains... Um, at the top of the news cycle, the better it is for the coalition. Um, but the Albanese government understands that. Um, they, they, that doesn't mean they like where they're at, but they understand uh, the potential of, uh, of that issue for the Liberal Party. So, um, uh, you know, I think steady as she goes, ignore the noise, um, stick to your reform program, um, but have your have your antenna up, and you know, we'll talk about some other issues that are on the horizon. Um, you know, what's happening in Tasmania, and I think we should talk a little bit about Queensland and some of the recent by-election results there. So you know, there is certainly trouble ahead. Well, that's a good but segue, David. Let's go to the Apple Isle and talk about the um, Tasmania election outcome. Obviously, um, listeners to the show will note that we've done extensive episodes on this in the last couple of weeks because we've done a whole series um, leading up to the poll, which was a couple of Saturdays ago. Uh, another loss for Labor. Uh, that's four in a row. Um, you know, just talking to a whole bunch of people down in Tasmania, Labor Party people that, that you know don't want to come on, on air and talk about it, but certainly have intimated to me that it, the the feeling is rather bleak in Tasmania right now. The party is in administration. Uh, it went into administration a while ago for a very good reason. Um, folks are feeling like nothing really has changed in that period. Uh, obviously, this election didn't help because they had to turn their energies and focus on that as opposed to trying to restructure the branch. Um, but um, it just feels like the, the, the they are the weakest of all the Labor Party branches across the country. That they're struggling. I, you know, I, my heart goes out to them in some respects. It's a small state, small population. They lack people, resources. Um, you know, uh, a, a depth of talent. Um, both in the elect in the in the um, in public office, but also in the in the party side. Like, I mean, the party the head office has two staff. I mean, that's just that's tough work, right? Um, I'll, as a party official, I went down there. Like, the, you know, the party secretary and this and sort of the EA are just doing all of the work. You know, all of the work. Um, that's oh, I, I wouldn't put anyone through that. And I'm just wondering. I I just don't know. I just want to get your thoughts on, first of all, the outcome and sort of how does Labor reset itself in Tasmania? Yeah, the result was dismal. It was really dismal. And uh, we saw a significant primary swing against the Liberal Party, but I think w w that's explicable, not the least of which by the sort of debut performance of the Jackie Lambie Party. Um, but Labor really just stood still. And um, that that means really Tasmanians did not vote against the government, um, notwithstanding the fact that 
uh, you know, as you say, this was um, just another defeat for Labor. And it seems to me um, that, you know, in a seat like Braddon, the Labor Party complains there are too many working class people and working class people don't vote for Labor anymore. But then, you know, in the, part, in, in the south where, where there are in, in the seats around Hobart, you know, they say, well, you know, there's a lot of inner city Anglo Marxists here and they don't vote for Labor either. And it's like, well, it, to lose one of those constituencies is bad luck, but to lose both <laughs> of them is a little careless. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I'd be very low to surrender either, but they seem to be on the pathway of surrendering both. And and, and so that's really a microcosm of a challenge Labor's very familiar with. We face that in every corner of the country and where we strive to hang on to the alliance between the working class and progressive middle class. You know, that is the alliance that is the Labor Party. That's the alliance that creates majorities. Uh, and in, in a microcosm, we see in Tasmania that alliance in dire threat, and that's why the Labor Party's got 29% of the vote. Yeah. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty bleak. I don't know. I mean, we've talked a lot about Tassie. I don't know if I can add much more to it than that. Um, um, I just wonder, like... Well, I think it, we need to take it seriously. Yeah. Um, because, you know, seats like Bass and Braddon are there and Federal Labor needs those seats. Um, so I think, you know, the Labor Party can't afford to write it off as, you know, the idiot cousin, you know, to mm -hmm. use the phrase I'd used earlier about the Victorian Liberal Party. Um, we need to go down there and conduct some repairs. And plainly, the intervention um, has failed. Uh, and so I think it needs to be rethought and refought. Um, and it needs a level of open heart surgery that um, the branch has not yet had uh, because, it, the Labor Party's campaign apparatus needs to be improved and it does need to re-engage in the contest for the working class voters of northern Tasmania and it simultaneously needs to re-engage in, con in the contest for progressive voters um, around Hobart. You know, high education, high income voters around Hobart um, can't be surrendered either. Um, so, I mean, the Jackie Lambie debut I thought was interesting. Jackie Lambie, of course, has a it's a pretty interesting political message, which I think could be summarised as, we don't trust them and we're not taking it anymore. Mm. Um, and that's kind of it, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> and, um, but that, that sort of incoherent grievance voice works and it particularly has obviously worked in a portion of the constituency that she's just taken straight off the Liberal Party. And I can't help but suspect that, you know, uh, white working class Tasmanians would be the predominant group there, um, people who are feeling, you know, disempowered, isolated from the system um, and not stakeholders in the success of the state. Um, and so the Labor Party needs to do some deep thinking about, about all of those issues. I think, you know, free advice from the sidelines, um, the intervention in Tasmania needs to be... Um, uh, closely looked at and virtually re-undertaken. It's almost like we need an intervention on the intervention. I, I just I see similarity. <laughs> I see similarities between what's going on in the Tasmanian experience to what is happening with uh, some of the Western European social democratic parties, and it starts with this disconnect between the party and the voters, in that the party hasn't got a handle on what exactly uh, the the concerns are of its of its base and also by extension of that the concerns of the people they need to go after to win them into their bu into their bucket to their pile of votes um, and they're sort of like in this sort of well, to your point they're in this halfway house of you know the folks in Tassie in in southern Tasmania are a two left wing for us and the folks in the northern part of the state are two right wing for us but in some way you need to have a policy offering and a values frame that actually somehow brings those two people together, which is the social democratic experiment and challenge, right? I get it. But we have had success, and I just think that in Tassie they're, they're, they're struggling with that. So it's not just a – it's a policy challenge or a, or a platform challenge, but then added into the problems is then it's a resourcing challenge as well for the, for the, for the party 
uh, branch itself, their MPs, you know, talking to uh, uh, Jack Milroy last week on the show, you know, he's going through the, you know, the shadow MPs who are ministers only have one staff member. Now, even in Victoria, when we we're in opposition, we at least had, you know, at least enough resources for us to build a platform, go out there, talk to constituents, talk to stakeholders, get a sense of what is the mood in the electorate, do a proper research program, see, just test that if the if their suspicions are correct, formulate a, a platform, sets of policies, go out there, uh, communicate that to the electorate, make an argument against your opponent, win the hearts and minds of those voters, and then get go to go to an election and run a robust, modern, data driven election campaign. And that's sort of there's little bits along that journey that I think Tasmania are, are struggling with for a whole number of reasons, which we could do a whole podcast on. But in the end, it's resulted in four election de defeats, and that's. That needs to need to ch needs to change, and I just will wonder if does, does the national secretariat have to sort of almost allocate folks to go down there and actually work in Tasmania for you know the next four years uh, in the key areas where they need support uh, and help them get them back on their feet again because they just don't have the resources. Yeah, well, I mean, Tasmania has got more senators than Seven Elevens. It's got, uh, uh, and yet, as you say, a party office that is so inconsequential in terms of its resources that it's, you know, almost the least powerful player in the political landscape of Labor. And you've got trade unions down there, which often are nothing more than sub-branches of Victorian or national unions. So the union movement doesn't have the local leadership, that uh, it, local Indigenous leadership that it once used to have. Um, the Tasmanian trades all used to be um, literally the beating heart of uh, political labour there, but that has lessened um, as the influence of Tasmanian trade unions has lessened. So, yes, I think that all of those options need to be on the table and um, we've got to take it seriously because um, you know, there are five seats up for grabs there and uh, there's no reason why labour shouldn't... I mean, historically, we've done well there um, before... Uh, Wilkie and, um, you know, some of these others have got their stranglehold into it. Um, it, it, it we can't give up on those seats. Um, can I get uh, your reflections on the passing of Senator Linda White, um, former, um, I mean, she was a giant of the Labor movement. I mean, I knew her more as a, um, a union official than a, than a politician, um, but I think it was a for people more broadly, I think it was a bit of a shock to hear that her, uh, of her passing. Um, and I know that you'd obviously been a party official here in Victoria for a number of years. I just want to get your thoughts on um, on Linda's contribution to the Labor movement. Yeah, she um, was taken too young. She was only 64. Um, and I think her Senate career was still young, but we all knew she was loving it um, and, and having a really rewarding time there. You know, the Prime Minister joked that she was the most senior backbencher he'd ever encountered uh, because, you know, it was she was in the early days of her first term and was already um, chairing uh, committees of consequence in the parliament. Uh, I first met her as an official of the Transport Workers Union when she was an official of the ASU and we were um, working in the airline industry. Um, and, you know, she was a ferocious operator, <laughs> both against... Unions, she was grumpy with that day, and I often fell into that category, um, as well as against um, employers who she thought was doing, were doing the wrong thing by her members. And obviously the most of her career was in the trade union movement where she was um, a very, very powerful um, uh, influence, and not just in the ASU but more widely, I think, particularly in the airline industry, uh, which, you know, as you know, has just been such a difficult industry for the trade union movement. In, in recent decades and, you know, every single fight there has been hard and she was in them. So, I, but, you know, it was a very, very, um, you know, it was a wonderful send-off that um, Linda White got uh, at the um, Australian Centre for the Moving Image at Federation Square. Um, at some really magnificent speeches given in her honour, particularly by the Prime Minister and Tim Ayres, but others as well. Um, a lot of affection for her and um, a, a very moving send-off for a career that was, um, yeah, you know, cut short but still long, substantial, substantive, 
from a woman of sort of passion and tenacity. So, um, you know, well done, Linda and Vale, Linda White. Here, here. Um, let's go to federal politics. And I here's an issue that I don't well, have a lot well, of. Well, here's something I want to interrupt you, if I may, and just talk about Queensland for a moment. Yeah, please do. Um, because we also had, as well as bad news in Tasmania, I think Labor got some bad news out of Queensland um, where we saw uh, some by-elections at the state level uh, where Labor was sort of suffered some big swings in the outer suburbs of Brisbane, um, not big enough to um, uh, overthrow us in one of those contests but big enough to overthrow us in the other big swings in what were Premier Palaget's former seat. Um, and I think that's an unfortunate uh, marker that while, they're out of, while the coalition's outer suburban strategy managed to fall flat on its face in Dunkley, it did at the state level in its state of choice um, continue to do well. And we saw in the Brisbane City Council a sort of a softer, gentler Liberal Party get thoroughly re-elected and yet simultaneously in the outer suburbs, uh, you know, the more muscular and nasty Liberal Party um, win there too. So the sort of the, the Queensland branch of the, Labor, of the Liberal Party uh, managed to walk and chew gum at the same time, and that's a worry, um, you know, that they sort of greened themselves up for the contest in Brisbane um, but had lots of red meat for the outer suburbs and did that at the same time from the same division. Of the of the coalition, so uh, those signs I think suggest that what we perhaps what we already knew Queensland's crucial to the future of the federal government, um, and it is the coalition's strongest state where it is best organised and best comprehends how to campaign in its different constituencies. And they've obviously got a state election in October this year, um, and they have a new uh, premier who's um, finding his feet. How have you? Uh, how have you uh, uh, appraised his early days in the job as the new yeah, Premier of Queensland? It, it, I mean, I, 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 I'm very confident that whoever's going to discover how to win Queensland for the Labor Party, um, that I'm not among them. Um, I, 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 I watch the state from afar and I don't pretend any insight into it, but it seems to me he's struggling in, in the post palaget environment um, and it does unfortunately look like, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of Queensland voters waiting with baseball bats for the state Labor government. Um, I'd like to be wrong about that but I'm not sure I am. What that may mean, of course, is that, you know, some months prior to the next federal election, um, the state Labor government has been swept away um, and the state environment is transformed in the lead up to it federal poll. So that might, ironically enough, be good for Albo. Um, we'll see. But I think it looks like tough times for Queensland Labor. I mean, it's a short run-up as well, like difficult circumstances um, uh, for the Premier in terms of, you know, the handover has been quite short. I mean, I, there are good handovers and there are challenging handovers. And I think, like, just for example, in Victoria, Jacinta Allen um, has got a – one, big fat majority, and two, a number of years to settle into the role, build a relationship with the voting public, and then go to a poll, whereas in Queensland it feels like it is the complete opposite. I don't know what the margin is in Queensland that they hold government by, but certainly the, the time frame for, for which the, uh, the Premier can build a relationship with the electorate and say, hey, because there is an element of our p politic and campaigns that is very presidential, right? Um, your main spokesperson being the leader of your party has to be the main message carrier and has to be able to, you know, build a relationship with voters. And if they feel like there is trust and respect for that person and also what is coming out of your mouth, then you're going to have some success. But for, for him to do that over this short period of time certainly will be challenging, not impossible, but challenging nonetheless. And I just, I, 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 I'm stressed about that to some degree. Yeah. Well, I mean, a change of government in, in Queensland, I think is uh, the more likely uh, future, it, it does seem that the um, sort of political hardheads in Queensland made the assessment that a change of leadership would give them their best chance for another term. And so the handover wasn't 
you know, it was different in character to the Victorian one. It was one where you know, the premier, the sitting premier, had to be persuaded um, to move, and you know, that that's never easy, is it? Mm. Um, so, but yeah, it, it does look like you know. But one of the other differences from Victoria is that it's perhaps the most formidable division of the coalition, right? I mean, it, it, it's where the Liberal National Party is at its strongest, um, and. Uh, they proved that, I think, in these recent by-elections at the council and state level. Um, actually, while we're doing by-elections, good result in, I don't know if you saw, in uh, South Australia, though, uh, a state that's close to both yours and my hearts, uh, the, seat yeah, of Dunstan, the seat of Dunstan, which is uh, was the, the, um, the seat held by the former Liberal Premier Stephen Marshall, uh, Labor, has won that seat. Um, pointing out, been pointed out to me by some of our uh, comrades in South Australia, the first time in like since eighteen diggity three or something that a, a government has won a seat off of the opposition at a by election. Um, in yeah, in fact, I thought it might have been the first time ever, but it's possible eighteen eighty three was the last time. Um, just a monty of a humiliation for the Victoria uh, for the South Australian Liberal Party and the South Australian. De- branch of the Labor Party, which we, as we know, is elite, um, continues to demonstrate their eliteness. It's the old seat of Norwood as well. And I know the boundaries it have is. changed a lot. And obviously, uh, Vinny Ciccarello, um, the former me- Labor member for Norwood, held it for a number of years. And cl- so there's an Atoing community there. And Vinny's obviously former mayor and quite an yeah. eccentric character. But, right around I mean, Vinny bike won everywhere. It. Vinny kept winning it, but she kept winning it by like six votes. You know, it was, it yeah. was the one that would to leave you up at night worrying every time. But she did come home with it, so. Um, but it's come home, so it's uh, back in Labor, in the Labor uh, column, which is great. Uh, and well on to everyone in South Australia for jagging that result. Good stuff. <laughs> it's, it's just rude, really, to kick the South Australian Liberal Party while they're already prostrate on the ground. Well, I mean, the thing about it was is on election night, it was one that was still in a kind of too close to court for an, a long, long time. Like the Liberals got like 48.9% of the primary but couldn't get over the line. No preference, you know, hardly any preferences were coming to them um, and end, ended up holding onto the seat uh, uh, f- once the count had finished. But obviously Labor's then just, that was all you always felt like when this goes to, a, if this goes to a by-election, Labor's a good chance of um, jagging it and they did. So right on. Mm. Um, let's talk, uh, this has kind of got a bit of a foreign affairs vibe now that I, wa- I-, I want to speak to you about. Oh, actually, no, let's not do that. Let's actually, let's, Let's leave that to the end because actually let's go to listener questions because these are a bit more focused on um, federal politics um, and more in the kind of the campaign space. Um, the one, the first one comes from Karen. I won't say her surname because I don't know if she wants that to be mentioned, so I'll say it's Karen. But if you ever do give yeah. a question, just say, just say where you're from, what suburb or city or wherever. Um, her question to you, David, is I've noticed in Victoria that some of the unions are backing the Greens at the moment. Uh, do you know why? Uh, they are both protesting against some of the Victorian government's policies. They are both protesting. Okay, so there must be two. I was wondering actually which unions she was uh, talking about. Yeah. So, um, well, it, the Victorian state government has got sort of, I guess, two major um, challenges immediately in front of it. The, the first of those is a budget that's under pressure in the aftermath of the pandemic uh, and the costs that were both to revenue and to expenditure. Um, And so trying to rebuild the state government's um, budgetary baseline. And the second challenge it's got is uh, managing its work cover system and making sure the work cover system in Victoria continues to be affordable. What that has meant, arising from the first of those challenges is one of the government's measures has been to introduce a wages policy um, where it will only contemplate public sector wage rises within a certain band. And, of course, on the work cover front, what that's meant is that um, the state government's embarked on a reform program um, to try and um, make changes to the work cover system so it's sustainable. And both of those things have brought it into uh, you know, very predictably brought it into conflict with trade unions, most especially trade unions in the public sector. And uh, there's a dispute at the moment, for instance, with uh, Victorian ambulance employees 
um, where a government pay offer has been rejected. So I guess the sort of shorthand here is that public sector unions are going to be uh, in conflict with the state government over what pay rises the state government's willing to contemplate in enterprise negotiations going forward. So that's going to be a sort of a drumbeat of contest of, of, of discord going forward because wage rises are going to be trying, well, the state government's going to do its level best um, to con constrain wage rises because it's under financial pressure. And as ever, changes to work cover um, get the attention of the Victorian Trades Hall Council and the union movement more broadly. I think it's worth making the point that it's really the performance of work cover in the public sector, which is most particularly um, caused stress to the work cover system, but everybody gets to pay for the um, recovery of it. So this disputation um, means that the Greens uh, have, you know, opportunistically and predictably marched in and said, well, there we're, we don't like the work cover changes and we're going to side with the trade union movement in uh, that fight. Um, and we're going to prosecute the trade union movement's um, uh, argument in the legislative council. So, this is this is a, a this is a predictable problem. It's it's something that I think we're going to see more and more of over the months and years ahead as uh, the state government strives to grip up the budget, and that causes strains with constituencies like the trade union movement. It is interesting. Uh... I mean, that's a very good analysis uh, that you've given there, David. One of the things I think the keys to success of the previous Labor governments in Victoria was the strong relationship between the trade union movement base and the government in early days, locking down that relationship, um, getting agreements from them around, you know, upcoming um, EBAs uh, and collective agreements, the nurses being a great example of that and then being a great supporter of the government through thick and thin um, and both benefit from it, right? Both the union movement benefit from, from negotiations that are delivering good outcomes for their members, but also then the government benefit or the party or the, in this case it was the opposition, but then it became the government benefit from it because then you've got big stakeholders in the public saying, hey, we support this government because they're doing good things by our members and that helps carry that message. Um, notwithstanding the fact that there is a, there is a budgetary strain in the Victorian uh, books right now, you would just like to think that between the union movement and the government, they can say, okay, we're in a bit of a bind right now, um, but division is not going to help either of us because in the end what happens is if we lose government, it's not the Greens that are going to get elected, it's going to be the Liberal Party and then they're going to come after you. And so how can we work out, how can we get through this challenge together? Because we need to balance the books, but at the same time, we obviously want to support your members, but know this, that in the future we will do that. But right now we just need to park that. It would be kind of my way of we try to overcome that. And I say that as a trade union, a former trade union official, right? If I yeah. heard that to myself, I'd tell myself to go jump the lake. But yeah, <laughs> it's a bit utopian. I mean, labor governments are big employers. Uh, by virtue of the fact that they're governments. Um, and as employers, they inevitably come into conflict with their employees from time to time, whether that be, you know, in, in as a result of organisational restructures or, you know, new policy priorities or, in this case, um, a wages policy, um, which the union member doesn't like. This is not new. It's not going to be the last time. It, 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 it's something that confronts Labor governments what makes it, you know, more interesting at the minute is we have, you know, a, comp a, a, a comparatively new Premier um, and a comparatively, uh, and a Premier and, and, and a Cabinet that's sort of determined to stay on top of the budget. Um, and they can't really relent on that because of the post, because of the expenditures of the pandemic. Um, they don't have wiggle room in a way that they might have once. So... Yeah, it's not going to be easy. There will be conflict. Um, the Greens will be like jackals circling around the edges trying to pick off the uh, simple-minded. Um, the government's only real uh, way forward is to persist, um, but it, that, that demands two things of it. It means that it needs to be having the honest and forthright and meaningful dialogue you described. People 
the union leadership and the broader public need to understand exactly what the government's trying to accomplish. Um, and fingers and toes crossed, we've got to be sure that the government's reform recipe is the right one. And at the end of their work, um, the changes that have been made are for the better and, are, and, and achieve the effect uh, that the, the government uh, seeks. Um, I am not a subject matter expert, so I can't speak to the latter. Um, and I don't know what's going on in the state government to that level of detail, so I can't speak to the former. But, but that's the kind of uh, way forward. But we've just got to hold our nerve. This is, this is a government um, that employs a lot of people um, that's got a prudent wages policy and a tough budget. The second question is from Robert in Coburg, and he is asking, can we discuss why Fairfax don't understand two-party preferred? Now, to be fair, I tried to find out what uh, Robert was talking about here uh, on um, both social media and in just on, on, the, on the Google. Uh, I, I think what he's talking about is that in Victoria, the most recent Fairfax poll had the Labor primary vote below the Liberal National Party vote for the first time. Uh, and therefore they were extrapolating that, that that would mean that the Liberals would win, that Fairfax's uh, analysis of the research said that the Liberal Party would win the next election, but that's not the two. It didn't take into, into account two-party preferred. Um, and I, I assume that's what Robert's uh, uh, talking about. If I can expand that more broadly, because you started to touch on the, the Victorian government, how they're going. Um, are you worried by any of the most recent polling uh, that has shown some movement towards the Victorian Liberals? Um, and how do you think the the new Jacinta Allen Premiership is tracking after however many months now since Daniel Andrews um, retired from politics? Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not worried as a consequence of any of the polling I've seen. Um, I, I think the, the state government... Um, is going through a period of, you know, reset, as you'd expect in the aftermath uh, of a, a change of Premier. But that change, as we touched on earlier, was done, um, you know, effectively um, and collaboratively within the leadership of the party and the parliamentary party. So that's all good. Uh, the state of the opposition is just so woeful um, that, you know, the, the opposition leader Pozzolo's principal political challenge at the moment is to fend off defamation actions from um, current and former backbenchers in his own party. Uh, and so he's just in a sort of a, a, a mire that only very small hateful parties can get themselves into. Um, so there's, there's certainly strategic space for the state government. And the state government has got its work cut out for it just in public policy terms, um, in terms of getting itself into the you know in, into the next state election in a in fighting fit shape uh, with a good public policy story to tell that 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 alone even in the world where the opposition counts for so little that alone will be a big challenge for Jacinta and as we talked about there with the industrial relations issues um, she's taking that on as she must um, so uh, I think it's going to be a long story how do those uh, infrastructure projects go how does the state governments how does the state economy and state government revenues go how do we go getting the budget back into balance um th those are the big challenges for the state government i someone th th talking to some of our victorian labor comrades um sort of last month or so i'm sensing a little bit of fretting and and worry and concern and i and i well, good. Wanna, yeah, but I, I sort of said, I kind of said to them, and I'm happy to say it on the show here as well. Like, just like calm down. It's the election. The election actually is a long, long, long way away. The most important thing to happen, first of all, is for Jacinta Allen and her team to. It's almost like starting. It's like a start a startup when you come in with a new, you know, new air quotes administration, new leader. There's new staff in the PPO. They've got to get themselves set. You've got to give them a bit of time to settle in. And once they do that, and I think they've kind of finished that part, part one, uh, part two is for Jacinta to start to actually build a relationship with the electorate and for people to get to know her and to build a positive brand about what she's doing. 
The third thing is, and the, one of the things that we're saying is, well, what are they going to do now? They're going to go to money. They get, you know, they, what, what, what new things are they going to do? And I kind of push back on those kind of suggestions and go, hey, there's a lot going on in this state right now. There's a lot going on. And I think what we just need to do is continue to reaffirm that message with the electorate that there's a lot of things going on and we're going to continue to deliver on those things. There's still a lot of level crossings to get rid of. Uh, and they will continue to do that. They were very, they don't stop being popular because Daniel's no longer leader, right? People are still going to find a level crossing getting removed in their local neighborhood and they're going to be ecstatic about that. And we continue to communicate that, that this has been done by a Labor government, right? The, there's a lot of ribbon cutting to be done next year. Melbourne Metro is about to open up next year. This is going to be huge. And Jacinta Allen, who actually oversaw the whole of this project as an infrastructure minister, is going to cut the ribbon on this. There's a lot of things that are going to get finished or continue to get done over the course of all the way up to the next election. Plus, obviously, to your point, what we talked about before about getting the budget um, back in a good shape. Uh, that's a that's a priority, but I don't think we need to overcook it or kind of reset completely. I think that Labor's got a very strong brand in terms of public policy. They're doing a lot of good work, and they should continue to do that. They need to get the budget in a space where they can continue to push those kind of things that they're planning to do beyond the next election. And you know, Jacinta Allen needs to build a relationship with the electorate, and that takes time. Daniel, no one knew who Daniel was when he was elected leader in, in leader in uh, 2010, and then became premier in 2014. It was only really after the 2018 election and then through COVID that did he become the most popular uh, politician in the entire country. Um, and that takes time. And I think we just need to give uh, Jacinda Allen and her team a bit of time on that. That would be my message to folks out there. Yeah. If all else fails, try good government. Um, their, their, their challenge is to govern and govern well. Um, that's plenty to do right there. Um, and that's what they need to do to succeed. Uh, thanks to uh, Karen and to Robert for those questions uh, for today. And if you do want to give us a question for next month's show, um, please just uh, leave us a message on uh, any of our Dunn Street plat- uh, channels, like uh, all the social media ones, which I'll, I'll probably mention 10 times in the re- in the preview of the show. Uh, let's go to sort of the foreign affairs-y kind of world, uh, starting with our – we've got two former prime ministers, two former Labor prime ministers in the news, uh, Kay Rudd and PJK. Let's start with um, PJK. Uh, Paul Keating uh, met with the Chinese Premier and that sent everyone into a bit of a tiz. I want to get your thoughts on on this. Yeah, I, I think this was, uh, for the most part, a storm in a teacup. Um, so Wang Yi uh, had a meeting with uh, Paul Keating. Of course, Wang Yi found himself in a free country um, where uh, he found himself in a country where citizens were free to meet with him, should he choose to meet with them, different to China. Um, and so he availed himself of that right. Um, PJK availed himself of his own rights as a citizen and they met. Um, I, I, the, 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 the sort of news court media were desperate to paint this as an, an embarrassment for Penny Wong and the federal government and symptomatic of you know the the sneak you know it's, let's 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 smuggle in a little bit of you know communism into the labor party and then it's true leanings as pjk you know, a long-standing you know left winger inside the labor party <laughs> I know. yeah um so i, I mean a, a, a nonsense story I mean, paul keating's sort of personal uh, views around the conduct of international relations are well known. He t- has missed no op- opportunity to spruik them, um, and I think they, they, they everyone kind of shrugs and says, "Well, you know, he's a living legend. He's allowed to be a little bit crazed on this subject." Um, for for Wang Yi to meet, you know, an elder states person of uh, Australian politics, um, and is is in some respects very culturally Chinese, you know, to, to, to pay respects to a to a, a, a an elder and someone from China's perspective who's clearly a friend in foreign policy terms. You know, Paul Keating's outspoken against AUKUS, outspoken against nuclear submarines, denigrated Penny Wong, uh, accusing her of you know, basically confining herself to doing work that should be done at a consular level. Um, so, you know, for, I, I, if an Australian prime minister could pop over to China and visit some elder states, purse people without getting them killed, he might or she might do the same thing. Um, so storm in a teacup, um, 
News Corp made of it what they could. I don't think um, any voter out there wrestling with the issues of the day would have let this um, detain their thinking for a moment. No. And then Kevin Rudd uh, is the, obviously the ambassador to the United States of America, our biggest yes. ally. Yes. And he's uh, picked a fight with the former president of the United well, States. He had- to be fair Donald, to it, Donald J. Trump. Well, you know what I mean. Like it's kind of like it doesn't then, often fall to me to defend Kevin Rudd. <laughs> why, why is that, David? Do tell. <laughs> it's not. It's not a task I've typically been known for taking on, but on this occasion I will. I actually saw by fluke rather than good luck, uh, good management. I saw the interview uh, between Trump and Farage. So just to make sure the scene is properly set, you know, Donald Trump. Um, Republican candidate um, elect virtually um, is interviewed by his longtime friend and lick spittle Nigel Farage, and Nigel Farage is you know a, a charming charlatan from the United Kingdom who's most famous for leading the Brexit campaign, um, a campaign Boris Johnson joined at five minutes to midnight, but it was really Nigel Farage and his UKIP party. Um, which had laid the seeds for that. So, uh, you know, someone from the right wing of the political spectrum, um, longtime friend of Trump's, interviews Trump, and he says in his in the interview, you know, Donald, I've got a question that my friends at Sky News Australia have given me. So, thank you. We no surprises in the authorship. Um, you know, Kevin Rudd, terrible, terrible person, has said terrible, terrible things about you, um, and he's now the ambassador. Now, Donald Trump. So here's Donald Trump. He's got this question from his mate who's got a question from his other mates um, about some guy called Kevin Rudd. Like, he doesn't know who Kevin Rudd is. He said, I don't know a lot about him, but you know, if he just gives me any trouble, I'll run him out of town. Like, okay, what else is Donald going to say? Um, so what does this mean? It means nothing. It means if Donald Trump becomes president, he might have more name recall for Kevin Rudd now than he was otherwise going to. Um, but he clearly hasn't got any serious animus of his own towards him because he knows so little about him. Um, and you know, Farage and Sky News Australia will beat that drum. And, of course, as soon as Donald Trump uttered these words, you know, News Corp's out there, the Australian ambassador is going to be recalled. What a humiliation that he was ever appointed. Wasn't this a big mistake by um, Prime Minister Albanese? Like, stick it up your jumper. Mm. Um, Trump doesn't care, uh, and I, 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 a total non-story. I mean, I understand News Corp is a activist organisation. Um, it gets up every morning and tries to work out how to make the Labor Party's day a bad one. And for a few days, this is the story it selected for that mission. Uh, but we shouldn't think that it matters for anything because it doesn't. And, uh, yeah, well, uh, I, um, I mean, imagine if Kevin Rudd, when Kevin Rudd's name had been mentioned, imagine if Donald Trump had said, oh, I know Kevin, he's fantastic. Like, that's actually how you could have harmed Kevin Rudd. Um, (laughs) I mean, the worst thing than damning him would have been praising him. Uh, and the, uh, obviously the Tories in question time asked there all those stupid questions about it, to which a lot of people, even in the diplomatic community were saying, uh, don't do that because uh, you're undermining our mission and that we would appreciate that you just shut the F up um, and actually support Australia and our interests overseas as opposed to taking a side in domestic American politics. Yeah, um, it was interesting, wasn't it, how really the, the coalition past and present rallied around the notion that um, Kevin Rudd was doing a perfectly reasonable job as ambassador and this kind of attack was unhelpful. That, 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 that was interesting. Mm, indeed. If okay. Kevin Rudd can galvanise that kind of support, then it's proof really that uh, just about any ambassador could because uh, there are issues of principle here. There are. Uh, let's talk about ASIO, China. China uh, and these treason claims. Um, now, this took, this must have been at the start of the month. This feels like it was like a year ago now, but I th- <laughs> you're going to have to correct me because I'm going to try and summarise it, but um, I'm sure I'm going to get some of this wrong. The chief spook for ASIO was appearing at some kind of public estimates or some sort of public inquiry. And then towards the end goes, oh, by the way, we've got, there's a politician 
who is very close to China, an ex-politician who's very close to China, and we're not happy about this and something should be done about it. Kind yeah, of. no, it was much worse than that. Uh, it, it, it was it basically said there is a politician or perhaps a former politician at the federal level who was essentially brought into a spy ring by a foreign power and worked for that spy ring and sought to bring the relative of a sitting prime minister into that spy ring as well. So uh, it certainly left everybody with the impression that we were talking here about someone who actively and knowingly betrayed their country um, and sought to extend that damage as much as they could by recruiting the relative of a prime minister. So my question to you is, David, why would you do that? <laughs> yes, well, this is why. Uh, I, I mean, mean I think, I've always taken you as being so loyal to your country. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's precisely my complaint, um, and that is that, I, and I just think this is such an outrageous thing uh, by ASIO to do, and they did it knowingly. This wasn't extracted from them. They, um, they did. It, they knowingly released this information to the public domain, and I think. It's deeply problematic for a couple of reasons. The first is they've obviously now cast a slur over the whole category, a whole category of persons. You know, the, the legislators of every political stripe of a certain generation are now all know that there was a traitor among them. And it could have been any one of us, frankly. Um, so, so, you know, what it's, it's completely unreasonable for ASIO to to create a situation where this slur is cast upon a, a whole class of persons. The second thing that makes this problematic is why don't we know this person's name? I mean, if they are the traitor that is described, why have they not been charged? Why aren't they a household name? Uh, why hasn't there been a trial? Um, how is it that this person has suffered, apparently, no repercussions? Um, I, I, very big question. I mean, how can it be that ASIO is in a position to obliquely refer to this person in the public domain but not in a position to prosecute them? Yeah. Put up or um, shut up. Yeah. So so I think um, this cannot stand. I think ASIO has to be forced into saying who it is. I don't see any other reasonable course. Um, and then ASIO has to answer some questions about how it has completely failed to proceed against this person. Um, because if their level of confidence about their betrayal is such that they can talk about it openly, why is it not such that they could pursue a prosecution? Um, and how could it be that someone can engage in the behaviour described and suffer no consequences? It's completely outrageous. It is at best outrageous. It is at worst utter incompetence um, that they could cause this kind of reputational damage to their own legislature and their own legislators um, and at the same time re reveal the fact um, that they're apparently a toothless tiger and can identify traders but not proceed against them. It, it, was, that, was that uncomfortable, do you think, for the government? And how we ha and then how they handled it? I, I mean, I, I know that a lot of folks out in Voterland probably haven't been paid attention to this or probably knew about it for one day and then we've all moved on and it happened so long ago. But um, for, or say, um, what ministers would be covering this? It would be Richard Miles, it would be Penny Wong, sort of in their world. That would be like going, this ain't the, like, to your point, if if you were that minister and you had a level of concern about their conduct, like what do you do as a minister of the Crown to try and deal with this? You, know, you bring in, the, in ASIO and say, hey, what's the story? We need to fix this up because this isn't, we're not that keen on what you've just done. Oh, yeah, I think the National Security Committee of Cabinet and the Intelligence Committee has to direct Burgess to, well, tell the government who it is as a precursor to telling the country who it is. And I think ASIO needs to be made to understand that this course of action, while perhaps undesirable for intelligence reasons, um, is now forced upon us by their own actions um, because, I mean, for instance... What if a Prime Minister was to say in the House, um, we know that a previous head of ASIO was a traitor uh, and we know that a previous head of ASIO, um, or even if they just confined it to a senior ASIO, 
um, was a traitor um, and that they betrayed this country and they were part of aspiring. We know that. And then, but I'm not going to tell you who it is. And then you sit down, like, and then everyone at ASIO has to suck it up. Like they know the reputational damage to ASIO and to its leadership would be immense quite re- pro- quite properly, but they're then expected to suck it up. Well, that is what they've done to the legislature in reverse. So they now have to suck it up and tell us who it is. And then they can explain to the Australian people why whoever it is is not in jail. Well, there you go, David Feeney. What a high note to end on, really <laughs> sticking it to the spooks. <laughs> Just outrageous. I knew that one would piss you off. I'm glad we left that one to the end. That's good. (laughs) Um, Comrade, great to have you back on the show for our second edition of the Hour of Power. I don't know. I actually haven't timed this one. This may have gone longer than an hour of power, so we call it an hour-ish of (laughs) power-ish. Yeah, not a whole lot of power swimming around this room, but anyway. (laughs) Um, but we look. I'm sure there'll be plenty to talk about uh, to recap the month of April uh, in a month's time. But until then, uh, look after yourself. Godspeed, and uh, look forward to having you back on the show. A pleasure. See you next month. Thanks for listening to Socially Democratic. Did you like the podcast? Hit the follow or subscribe button and be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcast or Podchaser. And to get all the latest on Socially Democratic, follow Dunstreet on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And we'll see you next Friday.